hello, hello. Welcome back from coffee. Uh, if any of you are still out there in the entrance hall, uh, we're about to start our next talk, so please come on back. Sorry that uh, the coffee was a little bit, uh, how do you say, synchronous. <laughs> uh, we'll try to improve that <laughs> next time. Um, all right, uh, so the next speaker that we're going to have up today is Russell Branca, and he is going to talk about visualizing volcanoes. I'll let him tell you what that means. So I decided to make this talk a little more interesting this week by getting sick and losing my voice, so uh, please bear with me. Um, I'm here today to talk about uh, distributed interactive visualizations and uh, I'm Russell Branca. Um, I'm working at Cloudin building uh, data-driven applications and visualizations. And uh, <laughs> thank you. And so I wanted to talk to you guys about something that uh, I find interesting in, in terms of data visualizations. And uh, so a large part of my family has moved to Hawaii, the Big Island, which is you know, means I have to go visit them, which is tough. <laughs> but uh, one of the things that really struck me as interesting is the uh, volcanic activity there. And the whole island is created by volcanoes. There's five volcanoes, and one of them is the largest volcano in the world. One of the other ones is one of the most active volcanoes in the world. And you go there, and there's earthquakes a lot. I mean, not giant ones, not like the 7.4 in Guatemala, but... I mean, there's been 44,000 earthquakes since the turn of the century. And, you know, sounds interesting. There's a lot of data. I want to check it out. And uh, so the last couple times I've been out there, there's actually been heavy volcanic activity. Like, uh, this picture here is actually a picture I took. I'm about that far away. It wasn't a telephoto zoom. It was, I was 15 feet away from lava flow. And, you know, it's, that used to be a road. I was like, why would you build a road in a lava field? But somebody did. So it's not like, you know, Tommy Lee Jones and volcanoes and, you know, <laughs> running away from things. But uh, it's, it's still interesting. And it takes over roads and it takes over houses. And it's, you know, a serious issue. And so I wanted to use that as a demo data set of working with uh, interactive visualizations. And uh, give me just a second to check on something. So, uh, so I wanted to give you guys, here's a, a demo I put together of Hawaii volcano data sets. And this is the demo that I'm going to be using to kind of walk through some of the different uh, core pieces of interactive visualizations I see. And uh, we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so. I wanted to talk about what are the core pieces of interactive visualizations and why I think they're interesting. And one is because, as humans, we're great at pattern matching and pattern recognition. And it's something that computers are very, you know, they're, they're getting better at, but it's a challenging topic and something we do great. So how can we leverage that and then leverage computers' ability to do statistical computations and things along those lines? And so I think the core piece of interactive visualizations is that you have the ability for a human to say, this bit of data is interesting, drill down into there and give me statistics about it. Show me the relevant pieces there. Show me how it correlates with other areas of that. And so that's going to be the focus of this talk and where I'm going with things. So uh, first I see core components of being able to ask new, quest new questions and quickly get answers. I mean, the the lower the amount of time between questions and getting answers, the better, the more interactive. And then to be able to do that, you need to be able to filter on multiple dimensions of the data and be able to say, how does this particular set relate to this other particular set and show me the results from that. Then you need to be able to distribute it to your users in some fashion and you need to be able to work with the data, manipulate it, change its form, do what you're gonna do. And then you need to be able to take different types of data, put them all in one place, and 
visualize them and show them, visualize them together and correlate them. And you know, I always need sexy data visualizations too. That always helps. So, asking new questions. Now let me give a quick demo of what I mean by that. So let's say we want to see all the volcanoes in October. Let's come down here. There. Now we can see all the volcanoes in October. We can see up here we have a magnitude distribution. This is from 0 to 10 on the Richter scale. We've got the time of day by hour. This is 0 to 24. You can see some statistics about the standard deviation and the mean and the variance and the depth and different things like that. And we can, you know, quickly switch over to see a different month. And, you know, if we want to see how this compares to the rest of Hawaii, you know, we can go in there and see that. So going back to asking new questions, I think that determining what the question should be is where, you know, people come in and where we come in and your visualizations should provide a way for people to do that quickly and efficiently. And the whole idea of interactive visualizations should be helping your users figure out what questions they want to ask and then where to go with that. And you know, as I've said, low latency is key to this. So in the first demo, we used D3, which is mentioned previously in the Splunk talk, but uh, one of the things I didn't go into is what is interesting to me about D3, and that's what it stands for, data-driven documents, and in particular, data joins. Now, it's this concept that you have three distinct areas of your data. You have a working set, which is what your current data set is. You have new pieces of data entering, and it can either be completely fresh data or it can be data that was already in your working set, and then you can have data leave. So, in particular, our working data set is the current piece of data, or the current earthquakes in September through October. Now, when we move this, our working set changes, new data comes in as, the, as you adjust the timeline, and the pieces that were there will stay there, the pieces that are no longer in that time range will exit. And D3 provides a very simple way to do this declaratively and with simple functional transforms. And it's great for that. And uh, I think it's one of the few libraries out there right now that's doing good streaming data for data sets where you have updates and where you have, where you have you know, uh, data that may not be completely fresh, but it will be get an in-place update. Like, you know, even things like Backbone are great and you can add data to collections, but Backbone's notion of updating the data set is a full reset. And if you want to do transitions between data, that makes it much more complicated to do. And so, I mean, I, I think D3 is great at generating SVGs and graphics and whatnot as well, but personally, I think the data joins are far more interesting. And the fact that it manipulates SVGs is kind of arbitrary. I mean, you can use it to build HTML tables and have dynamic data tables from streaming data sets, and it works well. So the next key piece is dynamic filtering. And what I mean by that is we have our earthquake data. We have several core data pieces there. We've got the date. We've got the latitude and longitude. We've got the magnitude. We've got the depth. And we've got the time of day that the earthquake occurred. Now these are all different pieces of the data, and we want to be able to index them and quickly dive into them. So we want to be able to say, you know, show me only the magnitude ranges in two to three. And then show me only the ones that happened in the evening time of August. And this is really powerful. This is all in browser. This is you know, dynamic secondary indexes that you can filter on quickly. And this is being provided right now by Crossfilter, which is a D3 plugin that is designed to build secondary indexes, and it builds them very efficiently using binary heaps, and it also uses the craziest quicksort I've ever seen. And it uses uh, uh, 
sorting network, then it's, it's worth looking at if you're interested in algorithms. I have no idea what it does besides quick sort. Um, so one of the other interesting things about, uh, about cross-filter and these secondary indexes is that it really helps you discover data and discover interesting things about the data. Now, to give an example of that, when I was building this, I first had, I had the data going in cross-filter and I didn't have it overlaying on the map yet. And we noticed that there's this distinct, you know, bipolar distribution of the data set where we've got a spike over here and another spike over here. And we were kind of wondering what that was. And I mean, it's, it, you know, it lasts quite a bit through there. It's, it's definitely something that we can see from the depth histogram. So if we come in here, and if we look at it, we can see that the majority of the earthquakes in that uh, peak are coming from one specific area of the map. And this isn't something that we had noticed. I mean, we wouldn't have gone and looked at the Latin long longitude directly. I mean, you could do like k-means clustering and figure out different pieces there, or show like the difference in distance or something, but it's, this is a good example of what I'm trying to convey here is that just by throwing this in this visualization, we quickly notice pieces where there's something to discover about the data. And we go in here, and then we notice that the next piece of data is down along the southeast side of the island. And I mean, it's, it's very distinct that these are two different places of where the data is. And it turns out these are actually different volcanoes. I didn't know that until afterwards, but it, you know, it, it led me to that next question. Why are these pieces of data separate? And it turns out there's a very distinct reason that we wouldn't have acquired just from looking at the data, or specifically looking at it in a HTML table. I mean, we just would not have been able to see how these things relate to each other, that the depth is related to the latitude and longitude. Hmm. So the next core piece of interactive visualizations is distribution. You need a way to get this data to your users and as everyone here is familiar, browser's a great way to do that. I mean, it's everywhere, everyone runs it, you know, say what you will about standards. You make a program, most people can run it. And the other interesting thing is that it's also one of the best platforms for integrating data from different sources. You can get a JSON API to practically anything these days and get it all in the browser and represent it in different ways. And there's this notion these days about the two-tier app stack where you have a heavyweight client where your application logic runs in the browser and then you remove the middle tier and you basically have a single tier that controls your data and you know, provides some level of indirection on top of it. And I mean, browser is half of the two-tier app stack and it's, it's interesting, you can do a lot with it these days. So I wanna talk in particular about CouchDB, which is a distributed document database. It does incremental map reduce and stores it all in a B tree and will only update documents as they come in and uh, it speaks the web. You can interact with it over HTTP and get data in JSON format, which is all interesting. But the thing that I find very interesting for this is the master master replication. And took a little bit longer than I had hoped, but at the start of this presentation, I replicated this entire data set down, and I actually replicated down the presentation. I'll take a second to generate everything, but there's this, I'm using a Couch app in this particular case, and what that is, is data stored in CouchDB as attachments to documents where your binary data is there. These, this, uh, the HTML is there, and it, it lets you create this concept that I like to call an unfolding application. 
We're making a direct request to a document that has an attachment in press.html. We load that from the database directly. It loads in your browser. The browser processes it, realize you're including JavaScript files, which then go back to the same database, same design document, bring it all back in, and then it goes back into the database again and gets your data out of there. And it's, this, it's a cool idea for distributing your applications with your data. And there's no additional overhead to it. So it means that any of you guys can go to chibranca.clown.com slash volcanoes and replicate this entire talk, the demo, all the data in one piece. Replicate it to your lo local database, wherever. And you have that data. You can interact with it. You can add more things to it. You can create additional couch apps and throw them onto the data. And it's not an additional overhead to the application. It's just hosting static files, and it's not going to be overwriting anything. And then you can distribute it as well and let other people see your visualizations on there. And I think it's a really powerful form of distribution to be able to connect your application with the data and make them combined so that your application is just data itself, and it comes with the actual data set you're trying to visualize. So that's, this is the talk part that uh, I replicated. So this is the big data uh, track right now. And uh, one of the best descriptions of big data that I've heard so far is that big data isn't about the size, but rather when the size of it becomes part of the problem, when interacting with it is part of the problem. And so I think that when you get more and more complex data and you have to interact with it in different forms and combine a bunch of different data, it becomes complex. And I think that falls into a similar area of, of complexity of dealing with data. And I mean, take the uh, IBM's Watson. I mean, they had less than a terabyte of data and still had to use an entire cluster to process it. I mean, that's, that's not big data compared to Google or Amazon or anything, but they're doing incredibly novel things with it. And so, I think the other key bit is that you have to visualize data in its natural form. I mean, if you've got a time series, make a timeline. If you've got latitude, longitude data, geo data, visualize it as a map. And I mean, you can do graph data or whatever else. And uh, I mean, there's a lot you can do with that. And uh, another example of taking different types of data is uh, I found a uh, shape file for the Big Island that contains the lava flow hazard zones. So I took this shape file and I converted it to KML and we have it loaded in, uh, loaded in Google Maps as an overlay. And so now we've got one extra piece of data. We can see the uh, overlay here is a gradient from blue to red, where blue is the least hazardous zone to be in, red is a very hazardous zone where lava has flown within the last couple of years, and slightly less than red is where lava has flown within the last 75 years. And so if we go back to our original um, breakdown of where these earthquakes are occurring, we can actually go through here and see that well, that central volcano that we saw all of the activity at is actually right in the middle of that hazardous lava flow area. And so one more piece of data here is helping us gain a lot more understanding of it. And we come back down here and see that the same thing, that other high concentration area of earthquakes was another place where we've got high lava flow areas. And so being able to do a mashup or combination of these you know, heterogeneous uh, data types is really useful for these things. And it makes it so you can quickly gain knowledge that would be a lot more complicated to relate otherwise. And a couple other interesting things that uh, I wanted to add to this but didn't have a chance is uh, I wanted to be able to do a bounding box query to select, you select on uh, latitude, longitude of the places you're interested in looking at and uh, be able to get more volcano data because as, as nice as the browser is, 
I mean, we're, this, is, this data set's about 5,000 elements right now, and we're, we're looking at two to 500 earthquakes at a time, and it's about at what my browser can handle. And there's 44,000 earthquakes since the turn of the century, and they've got data back to 1890. So I would love to be able to get all of that in here, and it really kind of begs the question of how you can seamlessly transition from doing data processing in the browser, switch it back to a server for the larger data computation, and get it brought back, and be able to develop applications that you can't see the difference, that it's just, it just happens when it needs to. And I think that's the future of interactive visualizations and a number of other data-driven applications, and love to see that soon. Uh, a couple other quick notes. Uh, there's a project uh, called Miso Project, and they've launched uh, their first piece that's data set, and uh, it's one of the other few projects out there right now that will do streaming data sets and also let you create secondary dimensions on your data. And so that's another good one to look at. They do more uh, interactions with uh, servers than kind of D3 does. And they both have their strengths. And Cubism is another time series database. And uh, that's about it. I just wanted to show capabilities of interactive visualizations these days and what you can do with things like D3 and CrossFilter and how to distribute it with the different tools. Thank you.